Welcome back, my statics friends. We spent the past couple of videos doing lots of operations with vectors, things like finding resultants or finding so components of resultant vectors. And in doing so, we've introduced vector operations such as vector addition and vector subtraction. There are a couple of others that prove to be very useful whenever dealing with vectors, and so we're going to take a look at those today. So without further ado, let's get started. Whenever you're dealing with vectors, there are several properties and products that um, are often found to be very, very useful. And so this video, we're going to focus on the two primary ones that we'll encounter in statics. Okay, the first one is the dot product, and the second one will be the cross product. And we'll talk a little bit about some of their identities, some of the rules. This, this will probably be some mathematics review that you've probably crossed paths with at some point in your mathematical careers, but I think it's worth just kind of going over it one last time just to kind of Resolidify anything that you may have forgotten. So that's why we're going to do it. All right, so this video, we're going to talk, um, the first one we're going to talk about is the dot product. And what we have is we have two vectors, A and B, up here that are oriented with some angle theta. Okay, and so the dot product operation, products always take place between two vectors. Okay, although you can have a dot product that has a vector and a scalar, and I'll show you that one down below, but typically you're working with two vectors. So I have an A vector and a B vector. Okay, and so to evaluate this, okay, there were some operations that you did with, if you remember from calculus, with you know, things like i dot i, j dot j, k dot k, so forth and so on, but we're going to work with a, a different version of this identity that says that the dot product, a vector dotted into b vector, is the same as the magnitude of a multiplied by the magnitude of b multiplied by the cosine of theta, where theta is the angle that's between a and b. Okay, and theta is limited to be between 0 and 180 degrees. So um, it's uh, very convenient and it's a really cool trick that if you have the vectors themselves, well obviously we can find the magnitude using Pythagorean's theorem, I can turn around and find the angle that's between them in, you know, measured in degrees, which is kind of an interesting, kind of an interesting operation. Now the thing about this angle is it is not an angle in the x-plane or the y-plane or whatever, it is the angle between the vectors in the plane that contains both of those vectors. Okay, so that's the, the, the rule that we're going to look at for the dot product. Um, there are a couple of laws of operation that as we define things, uh, they, they're fairly normal. The commutative law that if I do A dot B, that's the same thing as doing them in another order B dot A. So order doesn't matter. Okay, multiplication by scalar, you know, so if I have a scalar constant, which is this little letter A here, and I multiply that into an A dot B, there's a lot of options that I can do on this one. I can take the scalar multiply it into A and then dot that into B or I can take the scalar and multiply it onto B and then dot those two together okay or I could dot them both and then multiply it by the scalar it's kind of an um, as another convenient one so lots of different uh, uh, multiplication uh, rules that to work with there okay and then the last one is the distributive law where if I have a vector sum you know which is uh, B uh, plus D, well remember our vector addition, that was a resultant, so the resultant of B and D, if I do A dotted into that resultant, that's the same thing as doing A dotted into B plus A dotted into D. So it's kind of like when we used to do that FOIL operation on, you know, back in algebra, where I take A times B and then A times D and then I put the sign of what's happening between them onto it. That's exactly what you're doing, except now we're doing it with um, product operations. Okay, a um, couple of identities that we have then is that um, if I have an I unit vector dotted under an I unit vector, it's a one. A J unit vector dotted into a J unit vector, that is also one. And then a K unit vector dotted into a K unit vector is also one. Okay, anything else is zero. I dot J, I dot K, K dot J, they're all zero. Okay, so, so those are, some, and that's kind of what preserves the scalar value. So if I take my two vectors, A and B, and I write A as, you know, X component times I plus Y component times J plus Z component times K, and do the same thing for B, and I do the dot product, the only pieces that survive are AX, BX, so because it's AX, I, and BX, I. So the I dot I is the one, so that's why AX and BX survives. 
the AXI BYJ gives you an I dotted into a J. And so that's why if it's zero, it doesn't survive. And that's why it's not in this list. So the only ones that survive are the I dot I, the J dot J, and the K dot K. So it's AXBX plus AYBY plus AZBZ. That's the dot product of this. Okay, and so that will, and it will give you a scalar value when you do this operation. <coughs> okay, all right, now, like I say, some of the applications that you can do with this, we can find the angle between two vectors um, or intersecting lines. And I can take that identity that we had, rearrange it, I can solve for theta. So if you know the vector form of A and the vector form of B, you do a dot product, divide by their magnitudes, take the cosine inverse, and that will be theta. Okay, you can also find the component of a vector parallel to a line, which is, this is the one that's really handy for us in statics. So say I want to find a component. So I have a vector A that's here, okay, and it's oriented at some angle theta from the um, x-axis. Okay, well, we know that for this guy, my unit vector on this will be an I, okay, and we know that we could do, um, uh, let's see, and then we've got um, our A perpendicular, so, so our A parallel, so if I'm looking for the one that's parallel to what would be my x-axis in this case on here, we know that if I had magnitudes, I could do A times the cosine of the angle would give me the magnitude of that guy, and then dot that into this unit vector in the I direction. That's the same thing as what we're doing. And so if we look at the parts and writing our formula, if we do the, the, the parallel magnitude of this guy is going to be the A magnitude times the cosine of theta, okay, which is, which is also the same thing as A theta or A vector dotted into unit vector of the line that I'm trying to work on. So if I did this, then we would have, you know, you know A cosine theta. So this is really, if I kind of skipped a step here, so A parallel as a vector is going to be A, um, magnitude of A cosine theta I, okay, would be the, what would be the AX portion of that guy, okay? If I want the parallel guy, then I can take this, um, the magnitude of the portion directed along that line, which is the X line, then this is going to be A times the cosine of theta I dotted into a unit vector I. So this guy is the unit vector for the X direction that we've talked about before, all right? And so what happens then is that these I dot I, that was my one that we talked about, and so that's what's left is just A cosine theta. So you can do all sorts of operations to find projections of forces on the lines. It doesn't have to be rectangular components. So anytime you have a non-orthogonal set of um, axes, this guy is really, really handy for being able to, I can take any vector and draw and project it onto a line. I could, you know, come down here and do an A projected onto this line. As long as I know the angle that it makes with it, we're in good shape for being able to do that. So that's a, a pretty useful operation, okay? So very handy for finding components and kind of working with those. All right, so let's give one a try here. Just kind of give ourselves a little bit of a taste, okay? And so what I have is kind of a, it's a three-dimensional kind of pipe assembly, if you will, in which I have the x-axis here, the y-axis over to the right, and z-axis is positive up. And it's a straight length of pipe for one foot, and then it goes out another two feet in the y direction, and then it comes down one foot, okay, at the same time as it comes out on the, along the x direction two feet. So it's kind of out in space a little bit. And what I'm doing is, is you know, I'm saying, oh, I'm gonna pull on the end of this pipe with a force of magnitude of 80 pounds. Okay, what we wanna find is, first off, we wanna find the, the angle between F and the pipe, okay, which would be the angle here. Now again, that's not in any given Cartesian plane, it's the plane that contains both the line of the pipe and the line of the force. Okay, and then we wanna find um, the magnitudes of the components of F, um, which are both perpendicular and parallel to BA. <clears throat> All right, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to take and we're going to first off come up with some position vectors to define the segments. So R from B to A, from here to here, is going to be equal to a minus 2I minus 2J plus 1K. All right, and I can kind of see that fairly quickly because my vector that we're defining R from uh, B to A does this guy, right? Okay, so from B going in the X direction, I'm going back a negative 2. That's the I component. I'm going horizontally a negative two. 
okay, and then I'm going positive, a positive 1. So that's the vector that we just wrote. And you could do the, the method that we used for finding position vectors in our previous video, but this one we can kind of spot check if we want. Okay, if I do the, the RBA, the magnitude of this guy, I get, you know, I'm squaring both of all of these terms, adding them together, taking the square root, that gets me 3 feet. Make sure we get some units on there. Okay, and then if I do RBC, which would be the line of action then of, of our force. Okay, and you can see that, um, so here's my B, this is the point C that's up here. Okay, and then I know that this line going from B here to this point, since that defines the line of action of the force, is gonna be, we're gonna go a negative Y direction in the amount of three feet, that's two plus one, that's the three, and then I'm gonna go up one foot because we're below it now we're up at the zero plane that gets me one kip or one k okay and then we're in and we're not we're two out on the x and we're two out on the x here so we're not moving anywhere on the x so that's why there's no i term on this and if i do the, the magnitude of this guy that becomes the square root of 10 and again you can kind of leave that as an operation for you guys to to verify as we kind of hurry our way through so then to find the angle between the force and the pipe, I now just do the dot product identity for those two position vectors because I now have a vector from B to A and I have a, or from B to A and another vector from B to C. Okay, notice that they're both starting at B and they're both going up, so they have to share a common tail point. So we're looking at that vector that's going from B to A here. All right, so, R, so RBA dotted into RBC. So I'm gonna take my two vectors, and we know that that's going to be the x components multiplied together plus the y components plus the z using the identity which we had. So we're going to take minus 2 times 0 plus minus 2 times minus 3. All of those are coming out of, out of this guy. So this minus 2 and that minus 3 are these guys. And then I have plus 1 plus 1. So there's 1, 1. Okay. And then I'm going to divide that by the magnitudes of these two things. It's going to give me um, 3 feet on the bottom and then square root of 10 on the bottom also. Okay. And so everything up here is going to be measured in, this is uh, what that would be feet squared, and this is feet squared, so the units cancel, okay, and so if I do the math on this, that number is 0 0.7379, okay, and then if I turn this thing around, we can come up with um, that the cosine inverse of this thing, the cosine of theta equals that, then the cosine inverse of 0 0.7379 is going to be 42.5 degrees, so it's pretty easy. Now, so that's probably the hardest calculation of all of these. So now if I want to do the, the portion that is perpendicular to the, or sorry, to, that is parallel to the, the force that's acting along the pipe at BA, I'm going to take my F vector dotted into a unit vector for BA. Okay, so if we've got my F vector, well, my F vector is this first term. It's going to be the 80 pound magnitude dotted into a unit vector for BC. That's FBC, if you will. That's right here. Right, and that would be my vector FBC. Okay, and then I'm gonna dot that into the vector that I'm trying to find the component parallel to. So from U, B to A. So here's 80, here's my, there's my unit vector identity, the magnitude, the vector over its magnitude, and then dot it into yet another unit vector. So you gotta be careful, you're not using the position vectors here, you're using the unit vectors on that. Okay, and so if I do that, then I can plug in all my math and what will happen is is that this whole thing is going to end up being this if you recognize that rbc dotted into rba over magnitude rbc and magnitude rba that is this guy if you look it's the same thing that we wrote here right so all i'm doing is i'm plugging in this cosine theta value so i dropped it in and said it's 80 pounds times that 0.7379 that was our math up here and that tells me that i have 59 pounds directed along that line ba okay all right, to find the, the, the perpendicular piece of it, once I have FBA and I have that angle theta, then to find how much is perpendicular to it, that we know then that the F perpendicular is gonna be magnitude of F multiplied then by the sine of this theta. Okay, and so that gets me a magnitude on that one. Okay, and that's a magnitude. Make sure we get all our operators on here a little more clearly for us. Okay, so then F times the sine of theta is 80 pounds times the sine of 42.5 degrees. So the perpendicular force 
magnitude is 54.0 pounds. Just plugging in the math and doing it that way. So, okay, it's a pretty good use of, um, of dot products for Cartesian vectors. You can find forces in any given direction just by simply playing with the vector forms. Very, very handy. And it's a skill that you'll see again in your calculus classes. So if you haven't already had it, this is a good one to, this is the kind of stuff they'll ask you to do. So very, very, very useful in both worlds, if you will. Okay. All right. Um, so we'll go ahead and we'll stop the dot product video there, keep it kind of short, and then um, the next video we'll cover yet another product, which is the cross product. And so without, and as always, if um, we found this useful, please toss us a like or subscribe down below or give us some comments and some feedback on what we can do to make it better. I've been kind of playing with the lighting issue, so hopefully it's a little bit more clear now. Um, and just kind of let us know how things are going. So otherwise, have a great afternoon and we will see you guys next time. Bye.